discussing the IIT JAM 2008 question paper, uh, specifically the biological sciences question paper. So let's start with section A. So section A, uh, questions 1 to 10, they carry one mark each. The first question, one of coach's postulates states that the suspected causative organism should, option A, not grown in artificial media, option B, get cleared by the host immune system, option C, always be associated with other organism and hence cannot be grown as pure culture and option D, be grown in pure culture. So this question is a direct application of Coach's postulate. So he had four postulates. So according to his postulate, <coughs> the said microorganism or the causative microorganism should be found in abundance in a diseased person when compared to a healthy person. The second postulate is the microorganism that you ob uh, obtain from this particular diseased person, it should be cultured in a pure culture. The third point is the uh, cultured microorganism, when you introduce it into a healthy person, it should again cause the same disease. And finally, the fourth postulate is that when you re-isolate this causative microorganism from the diseased person and when you check uh, with the initial uh, diseased person, they should be of the same species or they should be the same microorganism. So here the option is, uh, the answer is option B. The second question. Archaebacteria differ from bacteria in. So we know that um, Archaebacteria also come under Monera, but they, the main uh, uh, feature of Archaebacteria is that they are extremophiles, that is they can live in extreme conditions like high salinity, high temperature, uh, radioactivity, etc. So what is the difference between normal uh, eubacteria and Archaebacteria is the uh, particular outer uh, covering or the cell wall. So in a normal bacteria, we know that it has a glycocolyx layer, um, uh, uh, like the glycocolyx layer, uh, the glycocalyx layer can be in the form of a slime mold or it can be a capsule. So in case of bacteria, the outermost layer is glycocalyx, then you have the cell wall which is made up of peptidoglycan and then finally uh, you have the plasma membrane. So here is it where, where it differs in Archaebacteria. So in case of Archaebacteria, so if you look at the three layers, the outermost layer in Archaebacteria is made up of a glycoprotein layer. Then you have instead of the cell wall, instead of peptidoglycan, it is made up of pseudomurane. And finally, then you have the inner plasma membrane. So here the answer is option A, lacking peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Question 3, which of the following involving transfer of a phosphate group is an example of substrate level phosphorylation? So substrate level phosphorylation, uh, it refers to the formation of ATP. Uh, from a particular substrate because the uh, phosphate is transferred from the substrate onto the uh, ATP, uh, ADP molecule rather than an external molecule. So this is called as substrate level phosphorylation and it occurs in both glycolysis and uh, the Krebs cycle. So if you look at the reaction here according to the options, uh, answer D is the right option that is phosphoenol pyruvate to ADP. So in this reaction, phosphoenol pyruvate or PEP, when it combines with ADP molecule in the presence of pyruvate kinase enzyme, it results in the formation of an ATP molecule and uh, pyruvate. Question 4, lysosomal tagging of proteins involve recognition of. So this is a direct question um, which deals with how the particular proteins that are uh, synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, those proteins how they are passed on to the Golgi apparatus and from the Golgi apparatus how they are transferred to the uh, particular lysosomes for the further transport. So if you look at the um, structures, this comes under vesicular transport system. So we know uh, this is a very rough diagram of a Golgi apparatus. So Golgi apparatus has two phases, one is the cis phase and other is the trans phase. 
cis phase is the particular surface which faces the endoplasmic reticulum and which receives all the proteins that are to be further modified and it is given out uh, into the lysosome for further transport from the trans phase. So what happens when this particular protein um, initially enters the Golgi apparatus is that there are addition of certain uh, molecules or units into the protein which helps in the recognition of those molecules. So let me write down the reaction that happens. So what happens is here when the protein first enters the cis phase of Golgi apparatus, it, it attains a molecule of mannose. But mannose is not just gotten just like that. So man, mannose is actually modified in order to form first, uh, in order to form mannose 6-phosphate. And this particular protein with the tag of mannose 6-phosphate is, for, is uh, uh, transported into something called as the early endosome. So in early endosome what happens is so here you have your protein plus mano 6 phosphate it is like bound together. So here because of a particular uh, proton pump what happens is there is influx of protons from outside into the particular vesicle and it increases the um, acidity of this particular uh, vesicle. So because of this acidity the uh, bonding between the protein and the mano 6 phosphate it reduces and they are they disintegrate. So the when the particular connection disintegrates then the protein moves apart and this mano 6 phosphate is then recycled back into the Golgi apparatus and this protein is then further sent uh, this early endosome met it becomes late endosome and then further it is taken to the lysosome for further transport. So if you look at the options, mannose phosphorylated at 6th carbon in the N-linked oligosaccharide is the right answer. So for question 4, it is option B. Question number 5, in vitro group 1 introns have the ability to. So this is a direct question which deals with the splicing mechanism that takes place in the group 1 and group 2 uh, um, uh, uh, introns and uh, the answer for this is uh, A that is group 1 intron has the ability to undergo auto splicing in the presence of an external nucleophile. So we will uh, deal with this a little later because there is one more question which has been repeated based upon the same um, theory. Next question. In polypeptide chain the proline residue is unique in so uh, let's look at the structure of proline. So this is a cyclic amino acid and it is also a non-polar uh, molecule and because of this particular uh, structure of proline, the answer for this question is having its side chain connected to the peptide backbone twice. So for question 6, the answer is option D. Which of the following microscopes have workings principles some uh, most similar to the way a blind person reads. So technically what they are saying is which type of microscope is the one which actually kind of feels over its sample. It is a direct question the answer is atomic force microscope. So in an atomic force microscope you have a cantilever like structure with a particular probe at the end. So what this particular, so uh, uh, a, um, AFM has various uh, applications. So one, uh, up, so it can be uh, used to find the uh, stiffness of materials or the, its elastic uh, strength, elasticity of materials. So those materials can range from cells or some type of polymers, natural polymers, synthetic polymer does not matter. So it can be for used to found the stiffness of some particular materials. It can also be used to find what is the size of certain materials, um, what is the thickness of certain materials and so, on, so on and so forth. So there are various modes in which uh, AFM is operated. Uh, they are the uh, tapping mode and the non-tapping mode. So in a non, uh, in tapping mode, there is actual contact between this particular probe and the sample. So what happens is this probe moves through the um, uh, particular sample and it kind of feels around. So there is a particular electric current between the probe and the sample. So based upon the uh, height of the sample, that uh, that current changes. So when the particular uh, current changes, there are vibrations in the um, level of this particular cantilever. So there is a particular detector um, which detects a light that falls or the laser that falls on this probe and reflects back. So imagine in the normal condition this is the uh, condition of the probe. So when the light falls let us say it, it reflects back, like, back like this onto the detector and imagine now this probe has bent. So when the probe is bent the way the light falls on it is different. 
and therefore obviously there is change in the uh, length of this path. So, this difference in the light path is actually detected and that uh, has further, uh, it is further uh, used to compute what is the size of the particular sample. So, the answer for this is C atomic force microscope. Many plasma glycoproteins are protected from uptake and degradation by the hepatocytes in liver due to the presence of terminal saccharide moieties that are known as. So, here the answer is uh, option A, N-acetyl neuraminic acid. So, this is a particular, so it is also called as sialic acid, also called as sialic acid acid and this uh, sialic acid it occurs at the uh, end of the uh, uh, it occurs at the end of the sugar uh, chains that are connected to the uh, surface of the cells so like this or it can be part of a soluble protein so uh, this particular uh, feature is usually used by uh, bacteria some specific bacterium which uh, infects the body so when they release some toxins if there is a particular uh, um, uh, moiety, N-acetyl uraminic acid moiety attached to those proteins, they can evade the host immune system. So, that is what is talked about over here. So, the answer for this is um, A, N-acetyl neuraminic uh, acid. Ninth one, in mammals, which of the following vitamins is required in the amino, as, uh, amino group transfer reaction? Uh, the answer for question 9 is D pyridoxin which is also called as vitamin D6. So, here the what they have asked in the question that is um, amino group transfer reaction the reaction is also, uh, uh, also called as transamination reaction. So, transamination is the process of transfer of an amino group to a keto acid to form a new amino group. So, for example, an amino acid plus so amino acid plus alpha ketoglutarate it gives alpha keto acids and um, glutamate. So, what is transamination used for? So, it is used for deamination of uh, amino acids and uh, it is the major, um, it, it forms the major chunk of the reaction where the essential amino acids are converted to non-essential amino acids. So, here um, how is uh, pyridoxin required for this is? So, this reaction it requires an uh, aldehyde containing coenzyme. So, it ha requires a coenzyme. So, this coenzyme is an aldehyde containing coenzyme called as pyridoxal 5 phosphate, and this particular coenzyme is a derivative of pyridoxin. Therefore, for question 9, the answer is D pyridoxin. Uh, the next question Philadelphia chromosome is not linked to. So, the condition called as uh, Philadelphia chromosome, um, it, it is a result of uh, something called as a reciprocal translocation. So, reciprocal translocation, it refers to the process in which portions of two different chromosomes, they break off from those respective chromosomes and get switched to some other chromosomes. So, here the switching is seen between chromosome number 9 and chromosome number 22. So, what happens is the uh, uh, this second arm of chromosome number 9, it has an ABL gene and 22 has a BCL gene. But after the end of this reciprocal translocation, so what happens is um, this BCL uh, uh, gene is intact, but this ABL gene, those that portion has broken off from chromosome number 9 and it has attached itself to chromosome number 22. So, what is the result of this process is that it leads to uncontrolled cell division. So, we know that uncontrolled cell division it leads to cancer. So, here the uh, answer, so the options are A cancer, B hyperactive tyrosine kinase, C chromosomal aberration, D down syndrome. So, this, uh, it, this particular uh, phenomenon it applies for A, B and C. In Down syndrome, although it is a chromosomal aberration, um, it occurs because of trisomy of chromosome number 21. So, what happens is there is an um, excess amount, uh, excess number, instead of two copies of chromosome number 21, there is a um, excess of chromosome number, one more uh, copy of chromosome number 21. So, in spite of this being a chromosomal aberration, it is not a result of reciprocal translocation. So, the next section from question number 11 to question number 30, it carries two marks each. So, the first question is question 11. The question is, 
decreasing the concentration of sodium ions from a double stranded DNA solution results in decrease in TM or the melting temperature. This happens because of this happens because of increased dash. So you have um, options repulsion of bases between the two strands, repulsion of the phosphate groups between the two strands, stacking of bases in the two strands and repulsion of deoxyribose uh, sugar concentra uh, sugars between the two strands. So actually when you look at the, uh, we know that the overall charge of the DNA molecule is negative because of the phosphate. So if, uh, so what happens is it, DNA has some certain positive ions which actually counter this overall negative charge of DNA giving the stability and this particular uh, helical structure of the DNA. So suppose uh, we decrease, so sodium is a positively charged ion which helps in um, balancing this negative charge of DNA. So suppose we decrease the concentration of uh, uh, sodium that is the positive charge what happens is the negative charge will increase. So we know that between these two strands like this you have phosphate here and here. So what happens is the negative charge start repelling each other and the strands are about to come off each other like they are very loosely uh, held because they are already repelling each other. So we know melting temperature uh, of DNA is associated with the temperature at which the particular DNA strands can be separated. So if the DNA strand is very stable then you need a higher TM. Uh, but here already when the strands are the kind of separating from each other, uh, the uh, TM would decrease. So uh, the answer for this particular question is option B, repulsion of phosphate groups between the two strands. Uh, the next question, during pre-mRNA splicing reaction, a lariate RNA is formed when the intron cleaved up the phi dash spice, uh, splice site gets linked by a dash. So this is a sample of how the uh, um, uh, mRNA would look like that is the just the, uh, the just formed mRNA. Uh, so you have the 5 dash to 3 dash end. This is the exon 1, intron and exon 2. Within the intron 1 you have a GU um, uh, code AG at this end and there is an adenosine at the end. So this is the base that is within the intron. So at this point like when the uh, when the a reaction happens before this particular G, it is the 5 dash uh, splice site. After this G, it is the 3 dash sp uh, splice site. So this splicing reaction that happens, it is called as a trans esterification reaction and there are two trans esterification reactions that take place. So the first trans esterification reaction happens because so now you can notice that there is a hydroxyl group that is attached to the 2 dash carbon of this adenosine. So this hydroxyl group this actually uh, it brings about the cleavage of uh, or splicing of this 5 dash uh, splice site. So this leads to the formation of a loop like structure like this. So now you know that there is a 5 dash 3 dash with an OH end over hydroxyl end over here and this has formed a loop like structure but still we have this AG group that is attached to the second exon. So now uh, so um, during this particular react, uh, first trans esterification the phosphodiester bond that is between the G and this particular previous base uh, it is cleaved and uh, it is uh, so this results in the formation of a 5 dash 2 dash phosphodiester bond that between this G and A. So here it is a so at the end of uh, first trans esterification reaction this uh, nucleotide this uh, uh, this particular nucleotide is linked to the uh, adenosine that is internal to the intron. Then in the second trans esterification reaction what happens is this particular uh, hydroxyl group at this end it brings about the uh, cleavage or the splicing of the 3 dash uh, splice site. So this uh, what what this does is this releases this particular lariate structure because here it is cleaved. So now the exons uh, exon 1 and exon 2 are linked and this particular uh, structure is uh, removed. So here the answer for question number 12 is option A that is uh, 5 dash 2 dash bond to a base that is within the intron. The next question is question 13. 
match the endocrine gland in group A with the hormone secreted by them in group B? So this is a very direct question. The answers are anterior pituitary uh, prolactin, thyroid calcitonin, adrenal glucocorticoid and pineal is melatonin. Therefore, P3, uh, Q4, R2 uh, and uh, S1. So option B. So the answer for question 13 is B. Question number 14. The plant producing white uh, flower with uh, white seed coat dominant was crossed with the plant producing violet flowers with grey seed coat. Upon selfing of 144 F2 progeny plants, the number of plants continuing to produce violet flower with grey seed coat will be dash. So here if you look at, they have told that white flower uh, with white seed coat is dominant. So let us put it like white flower and white seed coat. It is crossed with a violet flower with grey seed coat. So violet flower with grey uh, seed coat. So this is a standard dihybrid cross. So when you, this is a parental generation and when you cross them, you would get a dihybrid like this. So this is the F1 generation and this will be dominant that is white flower and white coat. Now when you self uh, this particular F1 generation, you get F2 generation plants in a certain ratio. So we know that it is 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. So in that 9 flowers will have a white flower with white coat. The one will be recessive, so it will have violet flower and the grey coat. So this 3 is to 3, it refers to the recombinant that occurs. So this 3 would be white flower and grey coat. This would be violet flower and white coat. So they have given that in the F2 generations, each of the 144 plants that were obtained were selfed. So if you see 144 plants, we can get the ratio between these plants as 81 is to 27 is to 27 is to 9. So they are, they are asking when you do the selfing, which of the plants would still be producing violet flower with white coat. So you can look at the question in this way that when you cross self the other type of um, uh, other type of uh, uh, progenies that you have received, you may or may not get the violet flower and white uh, violet flower and the grey coat. But the only uh, a proper, uh, the only progeny which can which you can be sure that it will give a violet flower and grey coat is this recessive one, which we have nine plants of. Therefore, the answer for this particular question fourteen is D, that is nine. Uh, the next question. A dihybrid phenotype of 15 is to 1 is obtained while making a cross of this is an example of. So the answer for this is complete dominance and epistasis. So here when you look at so total this is a dihybrid cross therefore the total progeny is 16. So if you look at all 15 plants, uh, uh, so 15 plants have one specific uh, phenotype and one will have one, only one will have a different phenotype. So uh, uh, if you, what is epistasis? So epistasis is a phenomenon where two different genes interact, non-allelic genes and what happens is uh, the uh, progeny, the type of progeny you receive depends upon the type of interaction between the genes. So for example, you have here A and gene B. Each of these have a, a dominant and a recessive allele, a dominant uh, and a recessive allele. So here the condition should be that when uh, a particular uh, dominant allele A or dominant allele B or both of them are observed in this cross, you get the feature whatever A and B controls or whatever is a dominant character that would come out. But in the absence of A and B, that particular phenotype will go missing. So it is the only situation where you will end up with such a 15 is to 1 
cross. So, therefore, uh, this indicates complete dominance and epistasis. So, the answer for question 15 is um, option C. So, you can also eliminate like you cannot talk about cytoplasmic inheritance here and uh, it does it is not the um, uh, F, it is not the F1 uh, sorry, the F2 ratio for incomplete dominance or co-dominance. So, even then your answer is 15 is C. On infection by a specific virus, a host generates cytotoxic T cells that kill. So, cytotoxic T cells, so these cells, uh, they have uh, certain uh, structures which are called as MHCs, okay. So, what this uh, MHC, uh, so in a normal cell which is not infected, the MHC will be like alone. It won't have any other component along with it. And our body cells, especially T cells, uh, cytotoxic T cells, they will be able to recognize these cells as normal cell without any infection. But suppose let us say there is some sort of viral infection, what will happen is once the virus is inside, they, this, uh, there will be small pieces of these viral protein that will be produced. So, these small peptides that would be transferred to this MHC and along with this particular MHC protein, those viral particles will also be expressed outside on the surface. So, now let us imagine there is a cytotoxic cell which is coming in proximity with this particular infected cell. So, in normal situation cytotoxic uh, uh, T cells would uh, detect only this particular MHC or the self MHC but here what happens is it will detect the presence of this particular peptide and therefore this will, um, uh, this will help in destroying this particular cell. Therefore, the answer for question number 16 is A infected cells expressing self MHC. So, the MHC is self but in addition to that MHC it will have a small uh, a peptide that is related to the uh, virus that is infecting the cell. Uh, question number next question, question number 17 it is a very direct question which of the following combination show the chromosome number for human cells is uh, correct. The answer is um, option B that is Ugonium 46, fibroblast at G2M92, egg before fertilization 46 and uh, sperm 23. Question number 18, the function y is equal to 1 is an equation of a dash. So, when you say y is equal to 1, so they have just given here the point is uh, actually 1 comma 0. So, they have not specified the value of x. So, if you extend this particular line for the corresponding value of y is equal to 1 you will have different values of x. So, this will be 1 comma uh, 1, uh, this will be 2 comma 1 and so on and so forth. So, actually you get a particular um, horizontal line. So, uh, usually when we have a slope, so when you talk about slopes, you get either a slope line like this for which you find the slope or you get a line like this in the other way and still you can find the slope. But for vertical and horizontal lines, there are two conditions. So, when there is a horizontal line like this, you call the condition as slope is equal to 0 and if it is a vertical line, then the slope is undefined. So, here the answer is um, the function y is equal to 1 is an equation of a line with slope is equal to 0 that is option B. Bottle X contains 1 liter of water while bottle Y which has the same capacity as X is empty. Water is poured from bottle X to Y plot of the quantity of water y as a function of the quantity of water in x is. So, what they are talking about is you have two bottles. So, they have the same capacity one is x another is y. So, now only x is uh, filled and y is uh, empty. So, you are keeping on pouring water from x to y. So, which means as the water level in x is decreasing, the water level in y is increasing till they have the same capacity. So, let us imagine they are uh, uh, they are uh, stopping at a place or the, the change in volume can be described as decrease in x leads to increase in y. So, when you plot it actually, it leads to something uh, a line that is like this. So, as you 
decrease the value of x. So this is x and this is y. As you decrease the value of x, the slope, uh, the, the particular line becomes steep and it increases the value of y. So if you look at this particular line, it has a negative slope. Right. So here the answer is um, uh, a straight line with a slope of minus 1 uh, that is option D. The derivative of 2x uh, with respect to x is, so they have given that y is equal to 2 power x. So here I have done with log and options are given with uh, ln. Therefore, the option is uh, ln 2, 2 power x that is option C. For question uh, 20, the answer is um, C. Example of transcytosis is, so transcytosis is a process where both endocytosis or and exocytosis takes place. So endocytosis is when a particular cell is receiving a particular vesicle that is endocytosis or when it engulfs it is endocytosis and when it gives off a vesicle that is called as exocytosis. So here in each of these uh, options, transmission of nerve impulse from cell to cell is not an example of transcytosis. It is um, uh, uh, not an example of transcytosis. Pancreatic cell secreting pancreatic juice, uh, that also is not the option. A macrophage engulfing bacteria is by uh, just uh, taking in, so that is just phagocytosis. An infant getting antibodies from the mother's milk. So here for question number 21, the answer is C, an infant getting antibodies from the mother's milk. So what happens is, uh, when the particular uh, milk uh, with the antibodies, it reaches the stomach of the uh, particular infant because of so the uh, because of the acidic pH, what happens is this particular antibody it binds to specific receptors on the um, uh, gut. So let us imagine this is the stomach of the baby. So here there are specific receptors on the uh, surface like this for this particular antibody. So here you have the antibody that is coming. So this antibody is actually it interacts with this particular receptors found on the inner wall. So what will happen? This interaction will lead to an antibody um, uh, antigen receptor complex. When you look at the surface, like in detail when you look at the cell, the cells in this particular area, so this is the apical surface because it is facing the lumen and this is the basal surface. So this apical surface is more acidic, this basal surface is more a neutral pH, the ECF is a neutral pH. So here you have the receptors for the particular uh, antibody that is carried by the uh, mother's milk. So this antibody it interacts with these receptors and what happens is this is taken in by the particular cells uh, due, uh, uh, due uh, via clathrin coated pits. So clathrin is specific protein that is lining the uh, surface and uh, when the particular when it internalizes it internalizes like this the receptor and the antibody. So this forms a vesicle and this vesicle moves into the cell. So as this vesicle moves through the particular gut cell here, the basal surface, the I told you it is neutral pH. So what happens is there is dissociation of this antibody and as it moves through what happens? It is given out from the cell like this. So this is endocytosis, this is exocytosis. And finally, because of the, uh, as this vesicle reaches the EC, uh, extracellular uh, fluid, uh, because of the neutral pH, there is dissociation of this receptor and antibody and this antibody is then taken up by the, uh, the baby's bloodstream. So this uh, is an example of transcytosis uh, reaction. Which of the following techniques can be used to detect protein-protein interaction in vivo? The options given are 2-hybrid uh, assay, fluorescent resonance energy transfer or FRET, fluorescence recovery after photobleaching and gel shift assay. So the answer for this question is P and Q that is 
two hybrid assay and fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Now let's see what these uh, particular methods are in short. So in two hybrid assay what happens is you are trying to check if the two proteins that you want to interact have interacted uh, uh, and are bound to each other. So let's imagine this is the DNA and obviously for all these uh, biotechnological reactions you need have a particular report R gene right so let's say this is the report R gene okay so now this particular area is the transcriptional activator of a uh, tra uh, uh, transcriptional activator sequence of this particular report R gene so, it should be bound by a particular molecule which actually activates this uh, sequence and this in turn will cause the transcription of this reporter gene. So, what they do is that particular activator molecule they split it into two. So, you have something called as a bait and a prey. Okay. So, the bait, let's say, imagine it looks like this and the prey is something like this. And this particular bait, it will have one protein. So, this is the protein 1. This structure is the protein 1. This structure is the protein 2. The bait part, it consists of the first protein that we uh, require and this portion is actually the DNA binding domain. So, I told you this is a transcriptional activator sequence. So, there is a transcriptional activator protein which has to bind to the sequence and that protein is actually cleaved into two parts. So, the first part is the DNA binding domain and the second part which is actually the activator domain. So, this activator domain activates the transcription of this reporter gene. So, what happens is, so what you have to look into is that you uh, fuse this protein 1, you attach the protein 1 with DNA binding domain and you attach the protein 2 with the um, activator domain. So, when plasmids carrying the sequences for expression of this bait and prey, they are put together. So, what happens is there are different ways in which it can come out. So, uh, for example, let us say only the DNA binding domain. So, also before that, the DNA binding domain actually binds to this part. Activator domain is just nearby here and does not actually bind to the DNA sequence. So, what happens is if either the bait or the prey is bound to this, the reporter gene will not get transcribed. On, only when first the bait binds to this particular part and then because of the interaction between protein 1 and protein 2, this activator domain also joins, only that complete particular complex can cause the transcription of the reporter gene. So, what we expect is something like this. So, this is your activator, this is the DNA binding and this is protein 1 and this is protein 2. So, from when the receptor, uh, reporter gene gets transcribed and it gives some kind of uh, external uh, um, uh, changes like for example, if we use the lag gene, we can see with the change in color of the colonies blue and white. So, some type of, so when this uh, reporter gene effect is actually uh, physically visible, so then we can say that there has been interaction between the protein 1 and protein 2. So, this is the two hybrid assay system. Next, let us look at FRET. FRET is actually fluorescence resonance um, energy transfer. So, this is basically it involves uh, two chromatophore molecules. So, chromatophore molecules are that which can actually emit light. So, you will have two chromatophore molecules and one molecule is activated or it is at an elevated state. Uh, the other molecule is not. So, basically what happens is when one is at an elevated energy level and it is put near another molecule, it transfers that energy onto the other molecule. So, depending upon the distance between them, the transfer of energy also will differ. And because these are chromatophore molecules, they also emit certain colors. So, depending upon what type of color is emitted and depending upon the intensity in which this color is emitted, you can say what is uh, the interaction 
interaction between them also you can even say what is the distance between the two molecules. So the efficiency of this energy transfer is actually inversely proportional to the sixth power of the distance between the two molecules. So again this molecule has a particular color and there is another molecule like this which has a particular uh, color and when they interact with each other, so based upon the proximity of those two molecules, you can uh, detect the difference in the energy that is transferred. So that is, uh, th this method is FRET. So answer for that uh, particular question number 22 is two hybrid assay and fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So option A. The predominant mechanism of microRNA mediated regulation of gene expression is inhibition of. So the answer, the, they have asked about miRNA, microRNA. So here the microRNA, we know it works on the principle of um, RNA silencing. So here the answer would be uh, B, that is translation of the targeted uh, mRNA. So we know microRNAs are actually short uh, non-coding um, RNAs and uh, they regulate the expression of protein. So we know uh, the regulation can act at various levels that is um, after trans uh, transcription, before trans translation, after trans, uh, so all those things. So um, this particular miRNA, it acts at the uh, pre-translational uh, uh, level. Uh, this particular uh, miRNA, it acts or helps in regulating the uh, gene expression after during post transcription. So what happens is this particular uh, miRNA sequence, it binds through the 3 dash uh, UTR sequence. So what does this mean? So we know that when the particular protein is being translated, so this is the uh, ribosome and the end which goes into mRNA end which goes into the ribosome is actually the 5 dash end and you have the UT3 uh, dash end over here. So what happens is this particular microRNAs which initially are a double stranded molecule they can they get uh, 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 converted into single uh, stranded molecules and those molecules will be um, uh, uh, complementary to this particular 3 dash uh, UTR region of the mRNA and they bind to this region. So when it is bound like that, this particular, the bound regions become double stranded and it can no longer be translated. So that is how mRNA will stop the uh, translation of the, um, uh, that is how uh, microRNAs will stop the translation of the mRNAs. So answer is option B. Question number 24. In human reproduction, Spermatogenesis starts at puberty, that is true, spermatogenesis takes place in male and starts at puberty. Oogenesis starts at the fetal stage, that is true, fetal stage of the particular female when she is in the womb of the mother. Um, in human reproduction, following meiosis, one oogonium produces four eggs, which is false. One oogonium will give, or, or give rise to only one particular ovum because oogonium you have primary oocyte, then secondary oocyte, it will give one polar body. So this is meiosis 1, this is mitosis and this secondary oocyte will undergo meiosis 2, it will give one ovum plus the second polar body. Therefore, one ogonium will give rise to only one ova, while in the case of male, spermatogonium gives rise to four sperms. And following meiosis, one spermatogonium produces four sperms, which is true. Therefore, uh, except R, the P, Q and uh, S is true. Therefore, 24th one is option B. 3 dash acido, 2 dash, 3 dash, dideoxytimidine, that is AZT. Uh, with, uh, with the structure shown above has the potential to work as a drug against HIV because. So the answer to this particular question is its addition at the 3 dash end of the growing DNA strand will terminate the viral DNA synthesis. Option B is the right answer. So the reason for this is because uh, the A is a T molecule. It is an analog of the thymidine uh, base. So if you look at the structure of thymidine base. So this one is 
a z t and this one is time it so when the uh, suppose a z t is also present uh, while the virus is undergoing its uh, replication so if this particular a z t molecule is uh, used in the place of thymidin it would stop the uh, uh, further uh, growth it would uh, it would stop the uh, dna synthesis of this particular virus so because it is the analog of thymidin uh, it will help in stopping the dna uh, growth so the answer for 25th is b uh, this is the structure of azt and this is structure of thymidin and azt is an actually structural uh, analog of thymidin and while the uh, uh, virus is undergoing undergoing the dna synthesis if instead of thymidin azt is uh, used as a base then the uh, there will be stoppage of the uh, growth of the dna molecule and therefore uh, azt would be an, an optimal anti hiv drug so the answer is b its addition at the 3' end of the growing dna will terminate the dna viral synthesis so they have told that a bacterium has arose 3.5 billion years ago divide once every 12 hours under ideal conditions the number of generations the bacteria has undergone will be approximately so here the question is straightforward generation time is equal to time by number of generation so this is the total time in which the bacteria has grown that is what they mean so this could be hours or minutes that's up to you so here they have asked us the number of generations therefore number of generations is equal to time by generation time so here we know the time is 3.5 billion years so 3.5 into 10 power 9 in hours means into 365 days into 24 hours and here the generation time is 12 hours so both the numerator and denominator are in hours now so when you calculate it you will get it as 2555 into 10 power 9 which is 2.55 into 10 power 12 so this is 2.6 into 10 power 12 so your answer is a so for the question number 26 your answer is a next one which of the following match is correct uh, uh, between the inhibitors given in group a with their modes of action in group b so if you look at the compounds that are given that is antimycin a amytyl carbon monoxide uh, atrally um, attractylocyte all these are actually the inhibitors of the electron transport chain so when you learn that particular topic you will learn about all these so the answer for uh, question number 27 is a next is question number 28 this is also a direct question during synthesis of n linked glycosylated proteins in mammalian cells which one of the following composition of sugars is originally added as a core through dolichol phosphate precursor so here the uh, addition process actually takes place in a two step process but the end product of that particular process is n acetyl glucosamine two units of n acetyl glucosamine nine units of mannose and three units of glucose so here the option is uh, right option is uh, option a next question is question number 29 for accurate determination of evolutionary relationship within elephants an approach of choice would be to compare the size of their nuclei can you cannot the size of their golgi body no uh, the number of mitochondria in the cell no their mitochondrial dna sequence is a right answer because we know that mitochondrial dna is passed on from the mother to both the son as well as the daughter so in case you want to know the relationships within a particular uh, population of organisms it is better to compare their mitochondrial uh, dna you would also know how the organisms are related to one another but you would also see the progress of how the uh, the mutations that has taken place as the dna is transferred from one generation to the next so here the answer is for the 29th question is um, c 30th question 
Which of the following combinations of statements about the photorespiration is correct? Photorespiration generates no ATP. Uh, it is true. Photorespiration produces no glucose. That is also true. Photorespiration releases oxygen. False. Photorespiration does not occur in the C4 plants. That is also false. So here only P and Q are correct. So option B is the right answer. So photorespiration actually happens because of the um, uh, the Rubisco enzyme. So Rubisco is actually uh, carboxylase oxygenase. So it binds with both carbon dioxide as well as the oxygen. So in C4 plants, the problem is that because of photorespiration, so photorespiration is a very ineffective process where glucose is not made. So glucose has to be made in order for the uh, food starch to be produced. So because glucose is not made, the particular process is actually a very inefficient process um, in the C4 plants. And therefore, to counteract this particular photorespiration, that is to decrease photorespiration, the C4 plants has evolved a, a particular mechanism uh, by involving both the mesophyll cells as well as the bundle sheet cells. So what happens is instead of, uh, so in C3 plants what happens is the C3 cycle takes place in the mesophyll cells. So in order to avoid the, um, uh, uh, the uh, action of Rubisco on oxygen, what happens is the ox, uh, Rubisco, the C3 cycle in the C4 plants takes place in the bundle sheet cells. In the mesophyll cells, there it, it utilizes a completely different enzyme which has nothing to do with oxygen. It binds only to carbon dioxide. So therefore, it is much higher, it is of much higher efficiency. So all these comes under the photorespiration C3, C4 pathways. So here the answer for the 30th question is um, answer B. Mm -hmm.